Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. Got to call and email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. You don't have to leave a comment to vote. And uh, remember to become a fan on Facebook, facebook.greatdetectives.net. I realized that I have not yet posted audio of Pursuit, a show I announced last week we were going to do. So we're going to do it with uh, today's episode. So those of you with the app um, will have a bonus in there. It is an unhosted episode of Pursuit. Uh, And same thing for folks on the premium website uh, with a premium subscription. For those of you who do have the premium site, we we had five unhosted episodes we downloaded in April or uploaded in April. Uh, please download all the uh, April unhosted episodes uh, by the end of May because we'll delete those off the server. Uh, they're just kind of sneak previews of shows that we'll be doing. So download those if you want to hear them uh, before the end of the month. I want to encourage you, before we get started, to check out our web host, One and One, the world's number one uh, web host. Go to greatdetectives.net, click on the hosting link in the sidebar, or go to hosting.greatdetectives.net. They have several great plans, including the beginner plan. Anyway, Andrew says, uh, just drop in a line to say great job. Well, thanks so much, Andrew, and uh, we will be back on uh, Thursday um, and uh, next week with another episode of Let George Do It. In the meantime, though, uh, got any comments, email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Go to greatdetectives.net to learn more. It's time for The Hearse Was Painted Pink here on The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. The hearse was painted pink. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger's my stock and trade. If you're up a blind alley and nobody can help you, give yourself another chance and call on me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, how much do you charge for making a play for a beautiful dame? There's more to it than that. I may add the lady is dynamite. I may also add that the money is going to be okay. Also this. If everything works out... You'll be helping a lot of people out of that blind alley you mentioned in your ad. If you happen to be interested, let's do it. Happen to be interested, let's talk it over. I'm in room 918, Hotel Somerset. The name is yours truly, J.C. Collins. (laughs) Oh, Brooksy's never going to forgive herself for being late this morning. Me, Angel. What goes with you this morning? Oh, it's you, George. Oh, shucks. You guessed. Mm, I guess I overslept. But we were out so late last night on the Macmillan job. Well, just stay right where you are, Angel. I just wanted you to know where I was going to be. Where's that, George? Oh, just having a chat with one J.C. Collins at the Hotel Somerset. Uh-huh. Yeah, it seems we have a very distasteful assignment, Brooksy. I have to go out and make love to a beautiful dame, it says here. George, I'm on my way through to the office right now. What's more, it says here she's dynamite. I'm getting into something right now, George. You won't take it. Hold it, Brooksy. Take it easy. Let me see what this is all about, and I'll talk to you later. (laughs) Did you hear that, Raymond? This guy thinks is actual a J.C. Collins. Uh, That was the general impression we tried to create in that letter, Ernie. Sit down, sit, Valentine. Hey, now, look, I'm not a country cousin who just got in yesterday. Uh, I don't work for guys like you, Gorman. That's what you think. As far as anyone's concerned, you'll just be working for J.C. Collins. Or be smart. As far as I'm concerned, I'd be working for a grade A rat. And, Raymond, that's never smart. Don't get up, Valentine. You're not going nowhere. Uh, I know I can take your word for that, Gorman. So I'll just listen. Yeah, well, I'll give it to you straight. There's another guy in this town. I mean, the town's not big enough for both of us, and consequently... Uh, uh, well? Wait, I got no use for weights. 
Tell them what I mean, Raymond. Well, it's really very simple. As you know, Mr. Gorman owns a lot of property, including this hotel. He also has a great many business interests. <laughs> yeah, don't it? Yeah, I know. Some narrow-minded people call them rackets. Let's not be irrelevant. Anyway, it seems another businessman, Frank Granby by name, aspires to supplant Mr. Gorman in his various enterprises. Granby? I thought he was mistaken for a clay pigeon the other night. Oh, that was no mistake. But it was embarrassingly bad marksmanship. Frank was wounded, but he got away, and now he's hiding somewhere. And he must be smoked out. Yeah. And fair. Look, fellas, I know confession is good for the soul, but why pick on me? How did you know I won't leave here and reiterate some of these little intimacies? Well, huh? what do you say, Raymond? Well, not to oversimplify, Mr. Valentine doesn't want to play ball. Tell him what I mean. What Ernie means is... Yeah? You can help us smoke out Granby. Ernie's very basic in his thinking about these things, but uh, I believe he's got something. Uh, not to be precocious, I gather this has something to do with the beautiful dame who's also dynamite. Lila Parker. Sings at the glass hat. Yeah, Granby is nuts about her. If he thought she was playing around, he'd... He'd... Well, he'd... Go on and tell him what I mean, Raymond. All oh, the luxuries of life. Someone to translate your English for you. Well, uh, he's just being sarcastic, Ernie. But you're right about the dame, Valentine. Personally, I'd envy you this job if I didn't know Granby cares more for her than he does for his own life. You're going to make a play for her, Valentine. More than that, she's going to... Uh, she... Uh, Raymond... More than that, you've got to make her like it. Sorry, boys, no deal. You've got no choice. Raymond, call that number. Right, Ernie. Maybe Valentine will get what we're driving at. Here, Valentine, you take this. Huh? Hello? Brooksy. Well, who else would you call this number? Where are you, darling? What's this about? Uh, skip it, Angel. I'll talk to you later. You get what I mean? George, where are you? Uh, I, uh, careful what you say? Uh... Just want to tell you not to worry if I'm away a couple of days on this job. I know I can leave everything to you, Brooksy. Well, of course That's you can. That's all I can tell you right now, Angel. So long. All right, Raymond. You're not so good at translating. Just what does Gorman do? Ernie, make him let me go. Hey, well, you got no choice. Let go of him, Valentine. Hey, you see, Valentine, Miss Brooks is our insurance that you do just like Ed's. Like I say, now go on, Raymond, tell him. Miss Brooks, you've heard of hardened criminals, haven't you? Yes, Lieutenant Riley, but what does this have to do with George? Well, I'm a hardened cop. I only deal in facts. Well, I've been giving you facts. I know, I know. You didn't like the way Valentine sounded on the phone. He called the office and seemed so surprised when I answered the phone. What's so what? Sometimes I forget what number I'm calling. Well, he sounded so strange when he said that was all he could tell me. And then he hung up. Oh, look, look. Are you sure it isn't this business about a beautiful dame that's getting you so excited? Oh, don't be ridiculous. I know, George. So does Mrs. Riley know me, but even she has her doubts sometimes. Can't you see I'm serious? I even went to the hotel. There was no J.C. Collins ever registered at the Somerset. Who sent George that letter? And now, look, Miss Brooks, I keep fighting back the impulse, but I like that guy of yours. Me too. Well, still, I'm a public servant, and I can't go flouncing around after him every time he gets himself into trouble. Well, I'm going to do some flouncing around, Lieutenant. That I know, and I can expect the worst. Well, Lieutenant, if that's all you have to say, I'll... Uh, just a minute, just a minute. Yes? If Valentine is really in some kind of trouble... I'll leave word here where you can reach me day or night. Mr. Valentine? Yeah. Gus, the piano player, told me you wanted to see me. That's right, Miss Parker. Won't you sit down? Gus said you were one of my greatest admirers. By singing, no doubt. Singing? Well, that never occurred to me. <laughs> That's a new approach. I think I will sit down. Well, Mr. Valentine, if it isn't my singing, just what is it about me that you admire so much? Oh, don't you know? Yeah. I've known since I was 14. <laughs> You're one of the few women who'll be hearing that when you're 40. Is that supposed to be so good? <laughs> May I order you something? 
happy the way I am. What do you want? Oh, I'm just a lonely guy feeling sorry for myself in a strange town. Same line, but I can't say I've heard it read any better. What are you doing after your last show? Going home and rinse out a few things. I'll be waiting for you in the parking lot when you're through. You can grow an awful long beard waiting for somebody who isn't going to show up. Often wondered how I'd look with a beard. Listen, mister, and listen carefully. Hmm? Why don't you be good to yourself and go home? And hate myself for the rest of my days? All right. I know I look like something in a pastry window I shop to you. I that way. That's very good. Believe me, I'm poisoned. And it won't do a thing for my ego if you hang around and prove I'm right. Now stay away from me. See you later, Lena. You'll recognize me by my beard. I'm afraid you picked yourself the wrong boy, gentlemen. The fair Lila seems particularly allergic to me. What? What do you say, Raymond? Uh, they don't get along together, honey. Uh, don't give me that, Valentine. You're a pretty good-looking guy, and Lila, she isn't used to being lonely. Just keep trying, Valentine. The sooner Frank Granby finds out you have designs on Lila, the sooner this unpleasant little job will be over. Well, uh, I, I do have a sort of one-sided date to meet her here later in the parking lot. <laughs> you see, Raymond, he's doing okay. But don't try to play cute, Valentine. There'll be somebody watching you every minute. They'll be... Tell him what I mean, Raymond. I think he knows what you mean. Coleman, as you've said several times, I don't have any choice. I have to play the game your way because you have all the cards. Yeah, that makes sense. But look, if anything happens to Miss Brooks, you better make sure I'm dead first. Because I'm going to be out looking for you. You didn't think I was going to be here, Lila. How much do you want to bet? Oh, let's say an old Dick Tracy button. Move over. How'd you know this was my car? The parking lot attendant said this pink convertible dreamboat belonged to you. Oh. Where do we go from here? Oh, you're only hitchhiking, mister. You've got to take your chances. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But I can give you this much of a hint before we start. Well, that's a... That's a pretty good start. Anyway, it's language, Lila. But why the sudden change of heart? Suppose we say I'm curious about a man who's so willing to take poison. Hey, look, maybe I'm only a hitchhiker, Lila, but you're going over 75 now. I'll be doing faster than that if you don't answer my question. Well, how do you know anybody hired me to make a play for you? All right, it won't be any loss if we both go off the road. Now, wait a minute. Take it easy, Lila. Was it Gorman? Why don't you answer? What are you talking about? You don't have to answer. So it is Gorman. Now I know. Lila! Oh, this is going to be just fine. Yeah, what's that supposed to mean? Exactly where are we, George? Across the road from a gas station you almost didn't miss. I mean, exactly where does this whole mess leave us? Why don't you tell me? All right. You and I are going to make sure Frank thinks he's got everything to be jealous of. Hey, aren't you supposed to be in love with a man? Gorman wants to make Frank show himself so he can kill him. I want to know where Frank is so I can save him. What? I know what happened the other night. He's somewhere hurt, wounded, maybe dying. Oh, great. That gives me a very cozy feeling. Like walking around with a target on my back and another one on the front. Who's going to get me first, Frank or Gorman? There's a risk in everything. To gamble whether you live or not the moment you're born. Well, before you get too philosophical, Lila, maybe I can sneak in a phone call from the station. But it's closed. There might be a booth in the back. Maybe there's a way to get both of us out of this jam. What makes you such an optimist, George? Let me have police headquarters. Lieutenant Riley in homicide. Uh-huh, that's right. Yeah, I'll wait. Oh, sorry. Look, mister, you Better to... hang up, Valentine. I think you've got the wrong number. Well, I'm glad you know how to take advice. You make it very easy, Raymond. You insist on pointing a gun at people. Come on out, Valentine. Oh, it just wouldn't be an act without you, eh, Gorman? You're too smart, Valentine. You're too... Tell him what I mean, Raymond. You... <laughs> and to think words were unnecessary. Oh. 
<laughs> That's right, Raymond. Work him over. But don't let it show. We have to keep him nice and pretty for Miss Parker. <laughs> We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, here are some interesting figures. Did you know that the Navy calls its five-inch gun the workhorse of the Navy? And that this gun has to be relined after firing about 2,000 times? But that's nothing compared to the work done by spark plugs in your car. They have to fire more than a million times in every 1,000 miles. And if you've driven 10,000 miles, those spark plugs have fired 15 million times in white-hot temperatures. Dirty, cracked, or chipped plugs are often the cause of hard starting, lagging in traffic, waste of gasoline and power. So if your car has gone 10,000 miles without a new set of spark plugs, better ask for a set of Atlas Champions tomorrow. The accurate timing and full flashing sparking of quality Atlas Champions repay their cost many times over in superior car performance. Ask for them at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station where they say... And mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. And here's the situation. You're promised a fat fee to romance a beautiful nightclub singer named Lila. Very pleasant assignment. If you didn't find out that Lila is a decoy in a gun-happy feud between two racketeers. Yes, and that their insurance against you making a single wrong move is the girl you happen to love. That's why, like George Valentine, you pick your words carefully now as you talk to Lila. You know we're being watched, don't you, Lila? That character over at the bar makes it pretty obvious. What do you say we give him his money's worth? You're supposed to find me very fascinating. <laughs> I'm doing all right. In a quiet sort of way. At least he thinks so. Hmm. Frank ever saw me look at another man like this. Drive him crazy. Yeah, I, uh... I see what you mean. If he ever saw me light a cigarette like this, take the first pop and give it to you to smoke like this. What then? That would be murder, darling. How are we doing? I don't know. But I can see how you can lose an awful lot of ground this way. <laughs> you still haven't told me why you're working for Gorman. Before you answer, try to look romantic. It's expected of us. I'm in this thing for love's sweet sake, Lila, just like you are. So what do you say we leave it that way? George, I've got to find out where Frank is so I can help him. Gorman wants Frank to come out, too, only he wants to kill him. Have you got an answer? No, not much of a one. But it may be worth playing. Well, why don't you, then? All right, here we go. Oh! oh. <laughs> that was very clumsy of me. Lila, I'm awfully sorry. Oh, wait a minute. It's nothing, George. Just a Water? Oh, I'm sorry. Will you take care of this, please, waiter? Of course, right away. It'll only take a minute. Well, you shouldn't dismiss a minute like that, friend. It's 60 seconds long. You can get a lot done in that time. Are you sure Mr. Valentine isn't in his apartment? Oh, I see. And you haven't heard from him since yesterday? No. No, this is Miss Brooks. I'll phone back later. I'm getting nowhere fast. Maybe there's a J.C. Collins in the city directory. Hi, Miss Brooks. Oh, hi. Thought I'd drop in and see what's wrong with Mr. Valentine. Was that Leo? Have you seen George? When? This morning. He bought a paper for me, like always. You mean he was right outside the building and never came upstairs? Oh, I was with some big tough guy who was watching him every minute. Oh. But did Mr. Valentine say anything to you, Leo? Nah. Just took a paper and give me this instead of a nickel. He ain't getting absent-minded or something, is he? Here, let me see that. He started to say something to him, but he gave me a look that froze me up tight. So I figured I'd come up and talk to you. Oh, Leo, you're a few months ahead of time, but you're a real Santa Claus. Huh? I am? You don't know what a wonderful present you brought me. Uh, I did? The first real clue I got. You sure you're feeling okay, Miss Brooks? That's nothing but a union button. Every waiter wears one in every restaurant. <laughs> Lieutenant, I told you I was going to do some flouncing around. I know, and you did. Now, what's this about the waiter's button? I checked with the union. It was issued to Mike Spiegel, who works at the Glass Hat. 
He reported it lost this morning. I see. And you're sure Valentine slipped it to the newsy for a reason? A good reason. Lieutenant, did you know that Hotel Somerset is owned by Ernie Gorman? Uh, so what? Even a thug like Gorman can own real estate as long as he pays his taxes? Then Gorman could have told the clerk to say there was no J.C. Collins registered there. Mm, yeah, I suppose so. In the letter George got, there was, there was much to do about a beautiful dame. Well, there's a beautiful dame named Lila Parker singing at the Glass Hat. Oh, there's a lot of beautiful dames singing in a lot of nightclubs. But Lila happens to be the girlfriend of Frank Brandy, who, in turn, happens to be Ernie Gorman's biggest rival in this town. Say, that's a thought, Miss Brooks. It sort of interests me. In fact, uh, uh, I like it. Uh, uh, say, where's that waiter's button? Where are you going, Lieutenant? Well, now, now it's my turn to do some flouncing around. <laughs> You don't find this routine. I mean, sitting here with me, too boring, George. Somehow, Lila, I have a feeling that tonight isn't going to be boring at all. I think I'd like my coffee now. It's almost time for me to do my number. Sure, sure. Oh, wait a uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What can I do for you, sir? Huh? Oh, uh, you must be new here. Uh, yes, sir. I'm taking Spiegel's place. Just for tonight, sir. Uh, that coffee, George. Oh, well, no, not not just plain coffee. Not tonight, Lila. No? No, no, something more lavish than that. Uh, Cafe Valentino. Huh? Uh, do you think you'll be able to remember this way to... I'll do the best I can, sir. Oh, now, look, it'll take some mocha, a dash of ginger, a touch of Tabasco, a few drops of Benedictine. Oh, yes, and of course we uh, have look, to have... Look, sir, look, uh, would you mind writing it down here on the pad so they get it uh, just right back in the kitchen? Oh, certainly, certainly. It's really not as complicated as it sounds. Well, I just wanted to make sure we understood each other, sir. Oh, I don't think there'll be any question about that. Huh. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I'll be right back. <laughs> you certainly go all out to get what you want, don't you? Well, some things are worth a little extra effort, Lila. I see Gorman has a new boy watching us tonight. Yeah, well, that's good. Nothing like variety when every time you turn, there's a gunsel on your tail. George, why doesn't Frank make a move? He must know about us by now. I don't know, Lila. We've been sitting here for three nights now. Word must have gotten back to him about us. I don't think I can stand this much longer. Well, we have company. Oh, yes. I uh, hope this is right, sir. They said they did the best they could. Fine, fine. And I'll take the check. Yes, sir. Oh, there goes Gus with my number. It's a wonderful treat. We'll have to wait, George. Oh, it'll be here, Lila. Now, let's see what the Cafe Valentino made the check look like. Don't worry about Miss Brooks. You stick with Gorman and Granby. We'll be behind you all the time. Riley. We're sorry to drag you out of the glass hat the way we did, uh, Don Valentine, aren't we, Raymond? Personally, I'm filled with remorse. Oh, yeah, I can just see the tears in your baby blue eyes, Raymond. I don't like taking you out of the company of a beautiful dame, but the time has come. It's here. Uh, uh, tell what I mean, Raymond. Granby's going to stop hiding tonight. He's coming out. How do you know? We caught up with one of his boys after a little persuasion. <laughs> yeah, it's good persuasion. Uh, he told us. Granby knows what a Casanova Lily thinks you are, Valentine. So he can't hold out anymore, and he's going to pay her a little visit after she gets through singing at the glass hat. They're going away together. And that's when you're going to get your chance in him, huh? Congratulations. Well, what do you say, Raymond? Just being sarcastic again. Oh, is that what you call it? Anyway, you're not true yet, Valentine. Surprise. I didn't think I was. You see that Lila goes right home after the club, then you meet me across the street. I'd like us to be together, to see how this thing winds up. You're so good to me. Oh, Ernie. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, shall I bring Langley in now? Yeah, yeah, but you talk to him. I don't want to know nothing what happens except that it's done right. See you later, Valentine. I'll be downstairs at the barber's, Raymond. Well, you got a very sensitive boss. He does all right. Well, Langley, come in here. It's about time. Got me flying from Detroit. How long am I supposed to wait? Not long now. You, Gorman? No. You're going to deal with me. Who's that guy? Oh, I'm just sitting here passing the time of day. Now, if you listen carefully, Langley, you can be back in Detroit tomorrow morning. What do I do? Somebody getting the complete treatment? The full course. Hmm. Now, you park your car in the 800 block on Sierra Avenue. Yeah. 
Sometime after midnight, a pink convertible is going to pass you. You can't miss it. It's a big custom job. Mm. I don't have to tell you what to do then. Hey, Raymond, wait a minute. You can't... What about Lila? Well, now who's being sensitive? Lila's up there. Why don't you answer your boys, Gorman? They followed us here from the glass hat. I want to be sure. They try to park down the street and come over here. Well, you can see the light in the window. And you can't mistake that pink convertible of hers across the street. Yeah, that's right. You know, Gorman, I have a hunch Granby got in touch with Lila at the club tonight and told her he'd be in the apartment. Huh? What makes you think that? Oh, when we got back here, she was in such a hurry to get upstairs, she jumped out and left the keys in her car. Yeah? And all the boys got to do now is wait. We'll stay right here in this doorway. The other boys. Look what goes here, Valentine. I don't like the way you're acting. What are you cooking up? My, my, what a suspicious nature. I just know when I'm licked, that's all. Say, what happened to Raymond? You got something else to do. My usual stay out of things like this, but Grimby. And this I got to see for myself. Wait a minute. Uh, the light just went out up there. He must be coming downstairs. You stay here, Valentine. I'm going to get a little closer. I want to see him better when he comes out with it. I knew you'd be there, no. Gordon. What? See what you can do about this. She's trying to kill me. Lila, stop it. Don't be a fool. Go on, Gordon. Try one. When are you going to hide in that deep street? Oh, please, Lila, don't. Let me talk this over with Frank. Frank's not here, but he just died. Go on, let me see you run, Norman. The car. <laughs> That's right, the car. Uh, wait, come and stay out of that car. Don't you see she's trying to kill me? Come on. I told you I'm going to get away. You can't get away. Garland, wait. I tried to tell you. You can't get away. It's a plan. Garland. <laughs> This is the first time I ever saw a hearse painted pink and a corpse behind the wheel. Valentine, when you called that car a pink hearse, you weren't far wrong. I just had a good look at Gorman down at the morgue. Yeah, well, as you know, Lieutenant, I tried to stop him. Lieutenant, I thought you had men planted all around that street. Well, I did, but they weren't fast enough to keep Langley from killing the man who hired him. Anyway, he and Raymond are going to be out of circulation for a long, long time. What about Lila? Well, what do you want me to do, Valentine? Arrest a woman because she's a bad shot? <laughs> Let the D.A. decide what he wants to do. Well, that's that, Brooksy. Oh, uh, Lieutenant, would you join us in some Cafe Valentino? Why, you... Say, say, I've been meaning to ask you. What kind of a concoction is that? Oh, just a little thing I dreamed up, Lieutenant. But I'd sure hate to drink it. You can bet a successful contractor knows profit and loss just as well as a banker, a baker, or yourself. J.R. Armstrong, contractor in Oakland, California, keeps a sharp eye on costs when it comes to car operation. That's why he switched to RPM motor oil eight years ago. Today, Mr. Armstrong says, quote, I haven't had an engine breakdown since I started using RPM in 1940, unquote. An unusual record? Well, it's no surprise to RPM users. For compounds in this premium quality motor oil actually stop rust in your car's engine, protect hot spots left bare by ordinary motor oils, prevent costly foaming and corrosion. The low-cost operation Mr. Armstrong enjoys is typical of RPM users throughout the West. Another reason they prefer RPM 2 to 1 over any other motor oil. To cut your car expenses, ask for RPM motor oil at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations, where they say, and mean, we'll take better care of your car. (laughs) 
next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... There are probably darker places than this, George. I can't think of any. Yeah. We're almost up to the top floor now, Brooksy. You know, I could have sworn I heard somebody downstairs in the hall. Oh, probably just plaster falling off the ceiling. Oh, I can't imagine anyone living here. Uh, just stay right behind me, Angel. Mm-hmm. Oh! George! George, where are you? Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louise Arthur as Lila, Ed Max as Gorman, Louis Van Ruten as Raymond, and Jack Crucian as Langley. Music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Now, this was a particularly exciting episode of Let George Do It. This is probably the most hard-boiled episode. A uh, very nice change of pace from uh, the normal mystery story uh, with, uh, with uh, Claire and Lieutenant Riley forced to go into action uh, to, to solve the case. So I absolutely love this episode. This may have been the 100th episode, depends on who you ask, old-time radio researchers. Uh, number this is number 100. Uh, Digital Dilly uh, numbers it as number 107, I believe. But if it was 100, it was a good 100th episode. Uh, and tomorrow we'll be joined by Sherlock Holmes, who will flounce around. Uh, that was a phrase I had not heard. Probably the best meaning of flounce here is to move clumsily or flounder. I also found that gesture with the cigarette to make the uh, boyfriend jealous. That was kind of interesting. And um, with the way our culture's changed, it's not something we would uh, pick up on necessarily unless it was uh, explained to us. Andrew uh, emails in, uh, great show. I listen to it on my way to work every day riding on the bus. I like how you switch up the shows. Do you like Richard Diamond, Private Detective? Thought that you might. Um, I definitely do. Uh, great show with uh, music as well. I think I may have mentioned this before, but somebody actually went into all the Richard Diamond episodes and made like a separate um, release on archive.org of all of the Richard Diamond singing. So, that's going to be a treat when we get to it in a few years. You can follow the show on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And please remember to cast your vote once a month on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, though, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>